everyone. Welcome back to Get a Heck Yes with me, your host, Carissa Wu, and thank you for the viewers on YouTube as well. I have a very, very, very special guest. Her name is Krista Marie, and she is a photographer. She's a business coach and creator of She Calls Her Shots membership and podcast, one of my favorite podcasts. She helps creatives ditch the overwhelm and create thriving businesses by focusing on tactical strategies, habits, and mindset and confidence work that cru- that is crucial to your long-term growth. She loves to educate and mentor fellow photographers and creatives and help them turn their wildest, wildest business dreams into their reality via social media, her blog, her podcast, and inside her membership. Welcome, Krista. Thank you, Krista. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. I love your podcast, and you are going to interview me next week. Yes, um, I'm so I'm, excited. Yeah, <laughs> I'm super excited. <laughs> I've been on your website, your Insta, your podcast all today and yesterday, and I just love your vibe. Oh, thank you. Same to you. I love when I get to like – we were kind of talking about this before we hit record, but like getting to connect with other fellow – photographers that are kind of on similar levels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was looking through your whole website and then did, did it say you have 50 episodes? Yeah, I think I just – I'm close to 60 now, but okay. right around there. Yeah, we're the same. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I have 50, so I'm just like one step behind you. That's so cool. Yeah. What made you want to start a podcast? It's actually really funny. I would have never, ever assumed that I would have started a podcast. Um, uh-huh. It kind of just like – it kind of just – fell into my universe. Like I, this girl that I followed, followed for a really long time was doing a podcasting course. And I just thought, you know, kind of as someone who's like trying to share my message more, I thought, you know, this might be a really fun way of being able to do that. I had no idea where it was going to go or where it was yeah. going to take me. Um, and then sure enough, it ended up being something that I actually really love doing, but it was never like on my radar. If you would have asked me even like two years ago, I would have been like, no, like what would I say? I have nothing to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually never would have thought I have been would do a podcast. I love podcasts, but it was like my business coach that recommended it. And now I'm like obsessed with it. Yeah. And my daughter like make fun of me. Well, not make fun of me, but she's like, I can't talk. I'm on a podcast. <laughs> Oh, I know. Like my fiance all the time, he's coming over. He's like mocking. He'll like come over to the mic. He'll like kind of mock talk, you know. But it's like it's just so funny. I never would have guessed that I would feel comfortable enough to be able when I when I heard, when I would listen to podcasts or would hear people on podcasts. I just kind of assumed that they were like professionals. I don't know. It was like yeah, it was just yeah, never yeah. something in my radar. And then now yeah. I'm like, oh, interesting. Yeah, you're I'm good. just like you a normal have, person. No, you have a calming vibe, and you're good at talking. So it's yeah. Oh. It's, I'm so excited for this conversation, but you yeah. said you have fiance. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting we're, married this year. Oh my God. Are you getting married in Napa? Uh, we're actually getting married in Monterey. So okay. yeah, it's, oh man, <laughs> like it's, I'm so grateful for my planner. I'll just say that. Oh, like good. it's just a lot. <laughs> so did you hire like your, like a photographer? I know it must be hard. Yeah, that was, oh, that was like the first person. I had already known that for like five years. That was like a no brainer. Um, oh, but nice. then, yeah, like the venue I already kind of knew too. Um, the planner I knew because I'd worked with her before. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I think the thing I'm most excited about is that my core team of vendors feel like friends. Yeah, so yeah. like it really doesn't feel like, I don't know, it just feels like one big party, which is great. Yeah, exactly. You just hire the people you know. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so I guess tell the listeners just, you know, you know where you're from and how you got started with wedding photography and what you're up to now. Yeah, totally. So I actually started – well, so currently I'll start there. So I live in Northern California with my okay. fiancé and my two dogs. Um, I actually started my business when I was still in college, my photography business in 2010. Um, I was a sophomore or a junior – I can't remember. I was pretty early uh-huh. on in college, had no idea what I was doing. Um, uh, my roommate at the time had a wedding photography business. She And I, for my 21st birthday, bought myself a DSLR. It was like a Rebel G, whatever. It was <laughs> like early, early days. Um, and like a year later, my roommate at the time had a wedding photography business. She'd been doing it a couple of years and was like, hey, do you want a second shoot with me? And I was like, sure. That sounds like an easy way to make money and like kind of fun. So I did that with her for like a year. And then um, – Kind of a couple of things happened. I ended up shooting my first wedding by myself kind of on accident. I didn't know uh-huh. I was going to be shooting it until a month before. And after that, I was like, well, okay, like I did this. So now I guess I'm just going to keep doing it. And so that continued to grow throughout college. I continued to work full time <clears throat> up until 2019, actually. So I continue, I was kind of one of those people that like I actually like 
I liked my job and I what liked you, photography. What did you do? What did um, you do? Well, in the beginning after college, I was working for um, like I was a preschool teacher for a couple of years. Um, and then I ended up getting into uh, recruiting. Like um, I was doing third party recruiting. So I didn't love that part uh-huh. of my job, but it, like I wasn't making enough to be able to go full time. But I ended up moving to California, which I'm sure we'll talk about later in 2014. And I worked for a tech company and I did university recruiting in-house for them. And it was an amazing company, loved my team, loved the people. And it was great because since I had just relocated, like I I was rebuilding my business. I mean, I had no market in California. I had nothing. I had to start from scratch. So thankfully, I liked my job and also was like focusing on growing my business. But uh, But yeah, I liked it so much. And it was like five years in, I finally was like, okay, five years into my California life, I was like, all right, I'm kind of reaching that point where like, I can't, I got to pick one. <laughs> like I yeah. can't keep doing both of these at the same yeah, time. So, so yeah. So I finally went full time in 2019. Nice. What part of California were you living at? Um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. So yes, Northern, I've been in kind of Northern California the whole time, hopped around through like different cities throughout the Bay, but, um, but mostly stayed up in Northern California. That's awesome. Don't you kind of look back and weren't you kind of like, wow, like, I was crazy back then. Yeah. I mean, I also like – I know I think about – it's just so interesting, like the transition phase and like the things I'm still having to unlearn from like working full-time and being in kind of that like, okay, it's – you know, I get home. I have to like get all these things done. Like I still kind of find myself in this manic like have to get everything done right now mode and then I have Uh to remind myself that I don't live in that world anymore and I'm allowed to not (laughs) have that experience. So that's awesome. I know you talk a lot about overwhelm on your podcast, but yeah. how like how long in your business were you overwhelmed and like when was like the shift that you kind of figured things out? Figured things out. I know we're always trying to figure things out. Yeah. But. I feel like for me, overwhelm comes in in different seasons. So I okay. I still go through it. I mean, I actually had a season last fall um where I was like, just go, 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 hustle, hustle. Like I'm one of those people that I think of like a business idea and I'm like, this is going to be great. I mean, it was similar to when I launched the podcast. I was like, I'm going to launch a podcast. I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, this is going to be great. So I kind of have that tendency to do that. And so I recognized in myself that that that's okay. But but with that kind of comes these like reminders of you kind of have to be careful of the amount that you're putting on your plate. Yeah. So I feel Uh like I find myself in different seasons. Like right now I feel like I'm actually in a – because I came off of a season of overwhelm in the fall, I like very intentionally when I moved into the new year was like, okay, we're not going to do that. (laughs) Like let's kind of come back to a good place. But I feel like at any point in your business when you're really kind of working towards something, you have a big goal, you have something you want to do, you have a new business project or something like – Sometimes we just get so excited and it's like good energy, it's excited energy, uh-huh. but it's just so much energy that we end up yeah. investing in it and then all of a sudden we're like deflated. Oh, uh, totally. I was in the same boat as you because, you know, us photographers, 2020 was like, you know, no go or a super slow and we're all scared. Um, and then finally things started to pick up and we, we got super excited. I think we all got a little too excited and yeah. too like <laughs> eager beavers to book everything. And then it was just like, wow, like that was a shit show. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's hard. It's, well, and I, I imagine you felt the same way. I had never had more than a few months of not doing anything. And so I found myself really kind of uncomfortable because it was Uh like, you know, after like three or four months of not booking clients and like not having anything coming up because we couldn't be around people. Yeah, yeah. Like it was very uncomfortable. And I found myself just all the time like, what do I do? Like and almost like that. It was very much like a personal growth time because I had to sit with myself and be like, okay, like how do I want to live my life? Like I guess my job isn't as consuming as I thought it was going to be. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It was a very weird moment. <laughs> it, it is interesting because we think, oh, like, you know, the days go by so fast and like we don't have enough hours. But then when you are put in a situation where you have nothing to do, you're like, oh, the day is like really long. Yeah. <laughs> and like, and it really puts things into perspective because I think for me, that was the first time where I was like, oh, I like, I mean, I have weekends free and like, oh, I don't have anything. It was just, it was very weird because it was like kind of going from, not really ever having that because things get booked out so far in advance. Like you can yeah. you know, give yourself weekends off, but I mean like things just kind of sneak up on you a little bit. And then it was like to have this moment where it was just like nothing. <laughs> like, yeah. What do I do? Oh, it's so interesting. 
I feel like for your business, like you got started with, with your college friend and you kind of had the whole business already r- up and running before you even quit your um, tech job. But what what was like your biggest struggle and like how did you overcome it? Yeah. Well, I would say, I mean, definitely when I moved, that was really difficult because I had established my business in Central Florida where I lived, like Orlando area. Mm. So I was, you know, at well, two things included in that. One, price points in Florida, very different from price mm. points in California. Um, and just like having an established market here with referrals and word of mouth and all of this stuff. And then when I moved to California, I felt so intimidated, honestly, because in Florida, I feel like I had to get really creative, like especially when I was on shoots. Like we didn't Uh have beautiful backdrops and like gorgeous Uh mountains and like lakes and like we didn't Uh have uh that kind of stuff. So I felt like I was able to, you know, kind of make really beautiful images and like things that my clients wouldn't necessarily see. And then I moved to California and then I got so overwhelmed. Like I remember I booked my first shoot off of Craigslist. Um, It was like an engagement party at a hotel in like Lafayette, which is like in kind of the Bay Area. And I mean, it's just a hotel, right? Like in my head, I was like, okay, great. Like it's, you know, at least something for me to start getting out there. And even that, I pulled up and I'm like, oh, it's so pretty. I mean, it's just a hotel now, like at the end of the day. But it was – it took a lot of – inner mindset work to kind of – I just – I felt like such an imposter when I moved here. Even though I had been oh. shooting for like four years, even though I already had like a portfolio, my price point in Florida, like I said, was a lot lower. Uh-huh. I immediately had to raise my prices here, um, which I don't think I was mentally prepared for. But yeah. I realized if like I'm going to – if people are going to book me, I have to be comparable to people in the yeah. market. So I think it was just like the the mental shift of having to like – make that move, rebuild, and like trust my experience. Like it was just – it was a lot of mental mindset to overcome. Uh, Okay. So you talk a lot about mindset, like even in your questionnaire, self-care, and your podcast. What are like your favorite like go-to podcasts or books or mindset people? Like how did you get so like deep into it? (laughs) I've been like a personal development junkie for so long. I've like Mm. always bought books on like personal development. But I would say specifically for mindset, my favorite – my well, so the one thing that I feel like has made the most impact on me is money mindset because I think that our money mindset really plays into every single part of our lives because it's like yeah. whether it's your business, your personal finances, um, how you price yourself, the clients you're attracting, the way you talk about your business, like all of it kind of comes back to how you think about money and pricing and all of that. So I would say the first person that really kind of like I had read You Are a Badass at Making Money by Jen Sincero like yeah. a few years ago and okay. I really liked it. But then I recently, like within the last year, I was introduced to Denise Duffield Thomas. I feel like I talk about her on my podcast all the time. I like, I need to just invite her on my show because I'm like literally obsessed with her. But she has, um, she's based in Australia and she has like money mindset books. She has a podcast called Chill and Prosper. Um, She talks about money mindset all the time. And it was just like, I don't know, the way that she talked about it and that she's so tactical and practical, but a little bit of manifesting and a little bit of woo, but like Uh also really tactical strategies has really just been a game changer. Oh, I'm excited to listen to her. So what's her name again? Yeah, it's Denise Duffield Thomas. You can find okay. her on Instagram. She's at Denise DT. Like everywhere. Be like her affiliate. I know, literally, and like I'm not even a, I'm not a partner with her. I'm not affiliated at all. I'm literally just obsessed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everything's about money mindset. Like yesterday, you know, I grew my coaching program and you know, I have a team of two girls and some like person that does my social and um editing and I got the bill yesterday, like, you know, from one of the, my team members because she did all this extra work for me and I kind mm-hmm. of freaked out. And, you know, I started going to like this fear mode of like canceling like my Peloton subscription. I know you're a cycling person or like, like, yep. oh, shoot, like I need to book more weddings or blah, blah, blah. So and then but then I remember like this girl, Melanie Aubert on my podcast. Um, she's a money mindset person, too, which I love. And I was just like, OK. You're gravitating money everywhere yes. you go. Money's coming. Money's coming. Yes. And then and then I got like a text that, you know, a couple hours later and it was like, hey, we want to book you for a wedding. And 
I know I, I said I was retired, but I still need the money, the, yeah. the wedding income right now. Um, but it was just like, okay, get out of that fear-based mode. Like, you're okay. You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard because we just – our tendency as – people is just we kind of fall back into that fear. I mean, because like – and no matter what level you're at, no matter how much money you're making, every time you're investing or spending a little bit more, it never feels easier. <laughs> like yeah. it doesn't matter how much money you have, it always feels so scary. No, when you when you like, you know, send them the work, hey, do this, do this, like it feels like – you feel like a badass, but then yeah. when you get the bill, you're like, ooh. And I feel like nobody talks about that. Like it's like all these people you hear that like, oh, I'm growing it. I have a team. I have all this stuff. But it's like – on the back end, like it sounds like, oh, wow, they really have all this figured out and they know what you're doing. But like they're also in fear mode of like, oh my gosh, I'm spending so much money. Is this going to work? Like, Oh my God. Like, yeah, you need to have like the bottom line of your – the money you're making has to be like, you know, exponentially higher when you have a team. (laughs) Yeah. I can't even – my mind's like not – like I have people who come and help me with like project things or I do have people who like – I guess like independent contractors help me with things, but I can't even yeah. imagine having someone who's like a part of the team. Like right now, I'm not there. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it's so it's so interesting. Okay, how how do you get your what's your favorite heck yes technique? To getting yeah. the heck yes to your dream client. So I'd say for me, the biggest transformation that I kind of had in my business. So kind of going back to when I had first moved to California, I was just like looking for clients. I was like, how do I get people, like anybody, like I will take photos for you. I kind of – I went from being kind of specific to who my client was in Florida to just like needing the money and just being like I will take pictures of anything. And obviously not a great place to live, especially if you're a creative, not a great place to live because you're like not really feeling that fulfilled when you're not getting the right kinds of clients. So Uh uh um. I would say it kind of for me, like getting that heck yes, I feel like for me has started with getting very intentional about the kinds of people that I'm attracting. Um, So when I made that switch kind of into, okay, (laughs) I don't know why I decided to do this, but I'm not going to just try and attract anybody. Like here's my client. Here's the type of person that I want. And when I got really specific about that and I would have consultation calls and it was like, you know, for example, a lot of the time I tend to attract like a lot of like teachers. Like I get Uh a lot of teachers, educators, (laughs) or like people who are in marketing or sales. Like I kind of started to find these commonalities and like what is it that they need? What is it that they're looking for? So making sure that I'm speaking to them. And then when we get on the call, I already kind of understand what it is they're looking for. But But even further than that, like actually asking. Like I think sometimes we get so nervous on sales calls. Uh Nobody likes – feeling like they have to sell themselves. Yeah. But it's like we get so nervous. We just kind of like talk about here's my offer. Here's how much it costs. Like Uh here's what you're going to get. Here's all the value. And it's like instead, how about like turning it around and being like, what's important to you? Like Mm -hmm. tell me about this. Like really getting to know them and putting the focus on them. Um, Love that. Which I think just like just getting comfortable, I think on sales calls in general is like a big uh, change that helps. Yeah. I mean, when you get to your level, you know, gorgeous, like social and website and brand, like you don't really have to do too much selling because they already kind of know your work. So it is a nice point in your life and point in your career where you could just be like, tell me all about you. Yeah. You yeah. know what though? I'll be completely transparent. I mean, I still got in sales calls where and like people will tell me they'll go with someone else, right? Uh-huh. Like totally. and I think it's something that we have to recognize is that like in any business, no one's ever gonna have like a hundred percent like acceptance or like you're never gonna like, oh, every single person like inquires, like everybody books, like you'll still get on calls and like it may not be a good fit. You, like they might already know maybe you're out of their budget, maybe they're – but they want to hop on a call anyway. Like, But there will just be situations where it's just not a good fit. Totally. But it's like getting comfortable with that. Like people, yeah. people will tell you no and it's like, okay. <laughs> like yeah. it's, um, it's not like a hit to my ego. It's not like a whatever. It's just kind of like, oh, it's not a good fit. That's okay. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that mentality. Okay. Going back to your beautiful answer about like, you know, actually realizing who your ideal client is, it's going to – it's a great um, transition to our hot topic, but about creative visualization. But yeah. tell us about your hot topic and why you chose it, why it's so important to you. 
Yeah. So I'm obsessed with creative visualization for a couple of reasons. I think that for anyone out there who is a little bit like likes the woo manifesting, like it kind of hits the nail on the head for you there. But then uh-huh. even for people who are like, eh, I'm not really woo, like there's still a lot that you can gain from doing creative vis- visualization, even if you're not kind of into the manifesting side of it, if you're just like kind of more into like the sciencey part of it. So I'm just going to like quote from Medium. This is not me. I am not a scientist. I am not a person who like is in any way affiliated with like this kind of stuff. But uh-huh. um, so there's this thing called neuro- neuroplasticity. And basically when you practice creative visualization or these types of practices, it actually has an effect on the neural pathways in your brain. So it like literally changes the way that your brain, like the neural pathways are formed. So it's kind of similar to, you know how like, I mean, it's like Somewhere to think about when you practice something over and over again, you get better at it, right? So yeah. same thing is when you practice certain things in your brain, when you practice creative vis- visualization, you strengthen certain muscles. Whereas if you never practice it, like those muscles don't have any strength, right? Like they're super weak. So it's yeah. like the same thing with our body and with our with our brain. So essentially, creative visualization, I think about it in two different ways. So okay. the first way is thinking about you – doing or accomplishing something that feels really out of reach. Okay. So if you've ever heard of people um, – I love this example. It's like from Jim Carrey way back in the day. He wrote himself a $10 million check yeah. with a date and was like, I'm going to cash this check on this date because I'm going to be making this much money. He was like early on in his career, not yeah. making anything near that, right? But he like – went through this practice of like every day imagining himself cashing the check. What is he going to buy, right? Like what's he going to spend? What's his life going to look like? Practicing these things. And then, you know, all of a sudden one day, 10 years later, I don't – I think it was like near the date or somewhere like around the date he ended up cashing the check. And if you're hearing that, you're like, oh, that's cool. But like Uh the uh whole practice behind it is like we spend so much time thinking about the like – what could go wrong, like, oh, this isn't Mm -hmm. working for me. Mm -hmm. And so we're naturally not strengthening those muscles in our brain. Whereas if we take every single day, take five minutes, let's say you have like for wedding photographers, maybe you have like a dream venue that you're like, Mm. this is, this feels super out of reach. The clients that, you know, book here are like way out of my league, but like let yourself believe, like sit down, close your eyes, like What's it going to feel like when you book a wedding there? Like what time are you going to get there? What's the weather going to be like? What shoes are you wearing? What outfit are you wearing? Like, you know, imagine yourself walking through the property and like like letting yourself believe that this is actually possible because it like actually allows your brain to start believing like, oh, yeah, yeah. this is something that is possible for me. Like I can do this because um, a lot of the time we end up just thinking about that's never going to happen. This is super out of reach. Like we don't let ourselves actually believe that we're actually even capable of doing the thing that we actually want to achieve. Oh, I love that. I've I've read The Secret. I think oh, I was yeah. in college. And I also read the book uh, The Luck Factor. Oh, I haven't so, read that one. Um, kind of like manifesting stuff, obviously, The Secret. And then The Luck Factor is like creating your own luck. Mm-hmm. Um So I definitely have been into it, but I never been into like visualization. But yeah, can you walk us through like an example that what you visualized for yourself and then how you manifested it? Totally. So actually, my move to California is probably the biggest one, and it's the one that. And it's funny because this is actually before I really knew what creative visualization was. Uh I think because I was so desperate to move, I just was like throwing all, like anything that I could do to move, I was like doing. And then it wasn't until like two, three years later, I actually found out about this. I was like, oh, I didn't even realize that's what I was doing at the time. But so for example, I um, was living in Florida. I did not like my job, like literally coming home every day, pouring a glass of wine, crying, working on my resume, oh, yeah. trying to move to California, like literally every single day, repeat all the same things. And I realized that, you know, I had I think at that time it had been in Florida for about a year and a half. And I knew that I'd wanted to move to California for like a year. So, I mean, it had been on my to-do list. It had been on my bucket list. It had been on this like, okay, I really want to make this happen. But like, how? Like, I just was like, I felt stuck for a really long time. And I remember this was in, I think it was like February. No, it was January because I got, um, oh my gosh, this planner. 
they don't make it the same way anymore. And I'm totally oh. blanking. Laura, uh-huh. Laura. Anyway, I'm blanking on name. Anyway, I got this no planner, worries. writing uh-huh. on all my things, writing on all my goals, what I wanted. And I was like, okay, something has to change. I have to do something different. So I just started letting myself practice this. So literally on my lunch break at my job, um, I would go on Google Maps. This sounds so silly to say out loud, but like I would go on Google Maps and I would Google map through Walnut Creek is the city in the East Bay. It's like it's where Steph Curry like lived for a yeah, while. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's really <laughs> nice. Like uh-huh. I had been there once and like obsessed with it. So I would literally go on Google Maps. I would like walk down like streets, roads, find parks, find like apartment buildings, find restaurants. And I literally would sit there and imagine myself like, oh, I can't wait until I'm going to be on my lunch break and I'm going to go here for lunch and I'm going to like walk to this park and I'm going to live in this building. Like I would literally let myself start to think not like, oh, maybe this will happen. Like, no, this is happening. And like, I'm going to start letting myself kind of live in that experience. Uh Um, Or like I would take my dogs to the dog park, you know, and the dog park is great or these random places where you meet people where you don't know them. Like they don't know anything about you. You know, I'd get in conversation with people. They'd be like, oh, what do you do? And I would very confidently just be like, oh, I'm a wedding photographer. I'm actually moving to California. They'd be like, oh, wow, really? I'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm moving. I'm going to – take like do weddings there, all this stuff. I mean, I would talk about it in this sense where – and, you know, I didn't always like – I can't say that as if like there was zero doubt in my head. Like even Uh when I would uh say it sometimes in my head, I'd be like, oh, this feels really scary. But the more that I let myself practice these things and like visualize it actually happening, um, the more confident I got. Long story short, in April, I had applied for a job you know, I went through the due diligence. This is why I think with like woo stuff, you still have to – like I didn't just like manifest it and yeah, it just yeah, like yeah. fell into my lap, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Like so I was applying for jobs and I connected with these people. I had interviews and at the end of April, early May, I got a job offer in California and wow. in June, I moved out and like had a job. So in the span of like four months, I was able to actually make the move where I had been waiting to do that for like over a year. So I think it's just like it really does take this um, this ability to just kind of blindly trust like this is going to happen, and it and it doesn't. You're not going to feel super confident at first. You're going to kind of have some doubts, but the more that you practice it, the more you start to believe it. Uh, how was it like you becoming a coach? Was that hard for you? Because it was a little hard for me. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. <laughs> talk about like imposter syndrome too. Yeah. Like you're like, oh, like, but I think, and I, this is probably similar for you, right? Like you get this, you get to this point though, where you realize people do come to me for a lot of questions, right? Like yeah, I get uh-huh. people like, oh, how would you do this? How would you say this? How would you handle this? And I always feel confident when I'm answering people. And I was like, this is really kind of not that different. <laughs> like it's, yeah, you know, exactly. it's like uh-huh. a different structure, but uh-huh, like, uh-huh. but yeah, it was absolutely terrifying. Oh yeah. Okay. So the first part, okay. So first aspect, I'm just going to kind of recap. So do something out of your reach for me and you it was coaching. I want to be a speaker. Mm-hmm. You know, I, mm-hmm. I'm very, I'm visualizing me like on a stage full yeah. of like, I don't know, hundreds of hundreds, maybe thousands of photographers seems very out of reach, but I'm visualizing yeah. it. So I'm trying to, I'm doing Toastmasters right now. Yep. You know, I talked to some people at WIPA trying to like, you know, get involved with stuff so I could be a speaker, mm-hmm. trying to like manifest that. Um, what is the second aspect of visualization? Yeah. So I'd say first of that, all of that is perfect because you're doing the tactical things and you're also visualizing it and make sure when you're visualizing, like get really specific. So kind okay. of how I was like literally going in the city, Google mapping and like finding out places, like choose the conferences that you're going to speak at, like choose uh, the stages. Like what does that stage look like? Like, oh, it's hardwood floors. Am I going to be wearing heels? Am I going to be wearing flat? Like really let yourself start to get into the details of that. Um, but the other thing, so it's like kind of visualizing you accomplishing something. But then I think the other part of it that's really important is visualizing what your day-to-day life looks like. Because I think visualizing these certain events is really important, but it's really important to also understand like what type of person do I want to be when these things are happening? So when I move, like, you know, what kind of what kind of house am I going to live in? Like, imagine yourself waking up every morning. What does your bedroom look like? What is the decor? Is there a lot of light? Is there not a lot of light? Like, what does your morning routine look like? Are you going to wake up and, like, work out or have coffee or, you know, whatever it might be? 
But like really sitting down to, again, get specific. And I think sometimes one of the questions I get is like, but I don't know what it's going to look like. Like I don't know what my apartment. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's okay. I imagine that I was going to live in Monarch Creek. That's literally the – I feel like the one city in the East Bay or like in the Bay Area that I've never actually lived. Like I didn't move to Wana Creek. I moved to like the South Bay, right? Like – you, it, you wanted to be next to Steph Curry. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I just want to live in this really bougie place where like everybody walks their dogs and brings their dogs to the outdoor mall. Like that was like my dream. And it didn't happen that way, but I still moved here, right? And oh, it was like it yeah. didn't have to be as specific as I was imagining it to be, but like let yourself get really specific because I think it also helps you figure out like what do I want? Like what's important to me? Like when you start visualizing that, you get really clear on, you know, what type of place do I want to live in? Like it just helps you answer some of these questions because I think a lot of the times when we think about future stuff or where do you see yourself, a lot of the time people are like, I don't know. Like I want to live somewhere nicer or like get more clients or like make more money or whatever. But it's like, okay, Uh but what does that look like? So I think it's really important to like visualize yourself accomplishing the actual goals that you want, but then also the life that you want to live and who you want to be. Oh, do you like journal? Do you literally sit there in meditation and like visualize your yeah. life in five years? How's like what's yeah. like your like day to day? So I had – there was a while where um, I – I think this is really dependent per person. So for some of my people who are visual, like if you're a real visual person, one thing that I did is on Pinterest, I very intentionally created one Pinterest board okay. that had some kind of inspiration images. So places that I wanted to travel to, houses, like decor or like rooms that I wanted to have. And so sometimes – because I think for some people starting off, just the idea of sitting down and like closing your eyes and like – thinking of stuff sounds really daunting. Um, So one thing I was doing and I was kind of getting comfortable with it was starting a Pinterest board. And then, you know, every morning for like 10 minutes, I'd put on like meditative music and I would go through the Pinterest board, but like what image, like image by image. And I would let myself imagine like, okay, this is the type of room I'm going to have. This is the place I'm going to live. To just kind of get yourself comfortable until you can get to a point where maybe you don't really like need the Pinterest board anymore. And then you can actually just like sit down and think about, okay, what is it that I'm working towards? What feels important to me? Like, what is it that I want to, you know, practice right now? Krista, that's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, it, it can feel so weird, but I really feel like, again, kind of coming back to mindset, it's like, I think we don't realize how capable we are. Like you truly, whoever you listening to this right now, whatever it is that you want to book, whatever client it is that you want to have, it's like you can't have it. A lot of the times the limiting belief is your thoughts and like what you think you're capable of. And it's all about doing these things that can help strengthen that muscle. Oh, I love that. Um, this is a good question for you, but where do you see yourself and your hubby um, in five years? Yeah. So honestly – Probably in the same place. I think okay. like we have some things. The The main thing that I'm trying to work towards now is um, doing a lot of the same stuff but taking on less work and actually like enjoying mm-hmm. my life a little bit more. Okay. A lot of the times when we're in kind of hustle mode, it's like book, 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 make money, make money. And now I'm trying to like slow down a little bit more. So I'd say doing a lot of the same things, just scaling back and having more – free time. So like whether that's like doing some upgrades to the house, like being able to be outside more, like just being more present with what I'm doing and also more travel. Like I'm working with a financial coach right now. Like I'm trying to – it's so funny how when you're like young, you're like, oh, when I'm in my 30s, like I'm going to have everything figured out. And then you turn 30 and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, So right now, I think one of my goals is also to like for personal travel. Like I think for a long time, I was always like, oh, I want to be a destination wedding photographer and destination, all this destination, destination. I realized like that's a lot of stress. I'd rather just travel for fun for me like and go places that I want to go to. So um, I think that's one thing I would like to be able to do a little bit more is just some personal travel. Oh, okay. This is kind of like a lot to ask, but do you think me and you could do like a visualization um, meditation together? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see how you do it because yeah, one thing about me is I have a lot of like masculine energy mm-hmm. as far as like getting what I want. Um, even my book editor is like, uh, you are like trying to be woo-woo. I know it's your last name, but you're still not woo-woo. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the tendency to kind of like fight for what I want. Like, first of all, like I, I, 
I was like, oh, wow, like, I want to try to get on podcasts. And now I'm on like 20 podcasts. Like, yeah. It's just like I, I'm just such a go-getter, but I don't want to be like that. I want to be more like slow paced. And I think it's really going to help me like visualize that quiet space first before I start my day. So I think you could really help me. Yeah. I think one thing though is to like kind of recognize, I think it's important to recognize the energy that we have. So for example, I tend to be, uh, I'm also like very go-getter, but I'm like super introverted. And it was really hard for me when I started my business because a lot of the people I'm attracted to on social media, the people that I really kind of cling to are like high energy, very extroverted, like show up on reels all the time and doing all this stuff. And Uh uh I think before we even like kind of start to think about creative visualization or meditation or anything like that, it's like really just accepting that energy because I think it's really important because I think if if you come into it trying to have a slower pace or trying to have that, it's like it can feel like a lot of resistance. Oh, okay. So I think first just acknowledging and accepting that like that energy is totally great. First of all, you're validating myself. (laughs) Yeah. Like I think that first of all, that's like absolutely okay. But I think that if it's something that you do want to practice, it's like figuring out then in a way that works for you because maybe – maybe sitting down for five minutes and thinking about some, you know, big goal like doesn't feel like the right space for you to have. What would you say if you don't mind me asking? So I, you talked about maybe being a speaker at a conference. Like what's something that you feel is like you're maybe like two, three steps away from being able to accomplish? I think it's a little bit hard to get in that space. Um, I think once you get in like one, it's going to be easier. But then – just getting that first one mm-hmm. is a little bit hard, and I think I think I could do it and be good at it, but it's just like, what are those next steps type of thing? Yeah, as far as like speaking, like speaking on stage and all of that. Exactly. Yeah. So I would say, I mean, I think a great creative visualization could be to – well, first steps, because again, I like to go back to tactical things, is like doing a little bit of research and fun research. So like – what like what what conferences would I want to speak on, right? Because mm, I think yeah. that's some of the resistance that we have towards, I think, creative visualization or anything that requires us to kind of sit and be present is that we lack clarity. Like, mm, w- like what do I yeah. need to do? Am I just going to like close my eyes far, yeah. and like, <laughs> yeah, 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 like what am I going to do? So it's like finding clarity on, okay, you know, picking maybe one conference that like, okay, this feels like it's really out of reach, but like this is like my main goal. This is where I want to see myself being. Um And like, you know, kind of seeing the vibe, like what does the conference normally look like? Is it located in different spots each year? Is it always the same spot? Kind of just getting really familiar with it. And then being able to just like close your eyes and put yourself there as a speaker, right? So like for me, like well for you, right? Like let's say, for example, this conference is in, I don't know, just name like a place that you'd love to go to. Uh, I actually, I went to Evolve workshop before the pandemic yeah. in Palm Springs and I loved it. Oh, and I would love to be Palm a Springs, love. Okay. Yeah, it was so, so cute. Yeah, so then imagining yourself, okay, closing your eyes and sitting down and just being like, okay, you know, where am I going to stay? Like what hotel am I going to stay at? Mm, Like what am I going to be wearing? What am I going to be, you know, like what time am I showing up? What type of activities am I going to do outside of the conference? Like anything that you can do, it doesn't have to be super scripted. It can be really anything that feels exciting for you because I think the bigger piece is not so much what you focus on. It's just letting yourself think about it and imagine it. So, and even if only like a couple minutes a day and you're like, okay, cool. I think it's just about letting yourself start to believe on a day-to-day basis that like, this is possible for me. Like, I know it feels out of reach, but this feels possible. And sometimes like, I feel like when we do that, when we start to think about that, right, you start to think about like when you're doing your research, for example, like, oh, these people were like panelists and speakers. Like, I'm just going to connect with them, right? Mm. Like, I'm going to chat with them. Like, oh, I'm not going to do it in uh-huh. a way that's like pitchy or oh, weird. Like, uh-huh. but the more that you can kind of like do your research on these types of areas, right? Like, I started looking up apartments. Like, I'm like, well, you know, the creative visualization was like, where am I going to live? But then that also led to like me researching, like, well, how much are apartments? Like, what do I need to be making? Like, what salary do I need to have? Yeah. Like, when I'm having conversations with potential job people. Like these are things that I kind of need to be aware of. So I think it's just really about starting to train your brain into like preparation mode of like, okay, this is happening. Like let myself get excited and also get clarity around like what is it actually going to take for me to make this happen? 
Oh, and I love the fact that you kind of told me and the audience like to do your research. Yeah. And I think that was like the missing element for me because yeah. I'd never, you know, made a list of where I want to speak. And I that was a great tip to be specific about like the panelists that were on, you know, previous years and maybe reach out to them how they yeah, got and on. And just connect. And, yeah, yeah, connect. Talk with them exactly. Start I the think conversation. That's- that honestly, the clarity around that is the part that I think is lacking a lot of time. Because again, I'm all I'm all into the woo. I love the secret. I love the movie. Like I watch it all the time. It's just like a feel good movie. But uh-huh. you watch it and you're kind of like, okay, so like, what do I do? <laughs> like yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, understand. Yeah. And I think that I think that's why when I when I kind of manifested the move to California without even really knowing what I was doing, the more I started to learn about this, the more that that part really clicked for me is that like, yes, mindset, yes, visualization, and also research, clarity, preparation. Like by the time I had calls with people, I knew like, what does my salary need to be? Where do I want to live? Like I kind of already had that in hand because I was letting myself prepare for something. Oh, I love it. I love when like these conversations kind of turn into like a coaching session for me. (laughs) Isn't that fun talking about like therapy? <laughs> yeah. So for your coaching program, like in a nutshell, like what is like your bread and butter that you teach your students? Yeah. So I'd say for me, with the podcast, with coaching, like my biggest passion is helping take really complicated, overwhelming feeling strategies, uh-huh. whatever it is, frameworks, and breaking them down really mm. simply. I used to get really par- – or not paranoid. I used to get really – like perfectionism held me back a lot. Um, uh. And I think I really love teaching this because I overcomplicated everything in my business, like mm. literally everything. And I still even find myself today, I have to be very – uh, like catch myself when I start to overcomplicate things and ask like, okay, what's the easiest way I can get this done? Like how do I make this simple for myself? So that's what I love teaching for other people is like kind of pushing past the weeds of like I want to grow a big business, right? And like zooming out and being like, okay, but let's like think about how we can break this down and also how we can work on the mindset to actually make this a sustainable thing. Because I think a lot of times you get caught in this cycle where it's like, I want to build a really great business. And then like one thing happens and now all of a sudden our mindset's in the garbage. We're like, Uh, I'm awful at this. Why am I doing this? So it's like helping them, helping my clients kind of find a more stable kind of mindset where it's like, okay, I feel like this is, I'm not constantly up and down. I mean, we still all have up and downs, but maybe not quite as much as we used to. And then also along the same time, like, okay, how do I take these strategies of how I want to move forward and break them down into super, super small bite-sized things where I can actually take action and see wins? Wow. I don't think anyone else is teaching this. So, Oh, I mean, there probably are, but (laughs) (laughs) that's cool. I never heard um, anyone explain it like that. Yeah. Um, I'll ask you some fun questions just to kind of, before we wrap it up, but kind of a silly question or fun question, but if your wedding was a brand, how would you describe it? Or what would be like the value proposition of your wedding? Oh, like my wedding that I'm planning or (laughs) your wedding? Oh (laughs) man. Um, If it was a brand... That is a good because question. because you know we're business people. I know. <laughs> you know what's actually really funny? This is something that I struggle with, and I've even said this to my planner. I'm like, I have zero. Um, what's it called? Like, I can't like imagine uh, what things are. It's funny because here I'm talking about creative visualization. I can't like if you gave if you showed me different designs and stuff. Like, I can't put them together as to like what it would look like. Like, if you showed me, oh, here's your flowers for your table. Here's this. Here's this. Like, I can't in my brain like blend it together to like see what it would look like. Um, so I think I'm having a hard time with this question because I'm like, I don't even think I know like. I mean, I know what it's going to look like. like It probably look like the homepage of your website. (laughs) Probably. I mean, I think like the the vibe we're going for is very like California, like just like outdoor dinner party. So if it was like a clothing brand, it would be like (laughs) made well, Uh like – I don't know. Oh, that's something that, that's else. A good question. If you're, you know, I mean, I'm going to ask to other people, but like, if yeah, your was a, or if your brand was a clothing brand, what would it be? That's actually yeah. a really good question. That's so funny. Yeah, I love me. Well, cool. Okay, since you're a podcaster, ask me a little question, and then 
you could take it away with like where um like your lasting tips for wedding photographers i know you have a fun free fun freebie Mm -hmm. yeah so you can Um, ask me a question oh sure yeah what would you say is kind of over the course of the years of growing your business what would be something that you wish someone would have told you when you were first starting out that you feel like you just recently kind of learned? Because I feel like we're always kind of learning or relearning things as we grow. But like what's one thing that you feel like, man, I wish when I was just starting off that someone would have really emphasized this for me? Honestly, like I think it would be the whole like email marketing thing. Yeah. It makes life like a lot easier because with the emails, you could um, set up workflows, the lead magnet email sequence, get people in the funnel. Um, I started a little bit late in that game, um, but now that's what I teach mostly because I teach like getting leads on autopilot. Mm -hmm. Um, But start collecting, like, you know, talking to the audience that are new, start collecting those emails like right away and getting to know like Flowdesk or MailChimp if they're still around or whatever email um, service you use because it's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of marketing efforts. (laughs) Yeah. And really any automations that you can implement in your business are like going to be so helpful. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So I'm going to just fire it back at you the same question and because I love that question. Yeah. I think for me, and this is the biggest thing that I've I hate that it took me so long to focus on this, but for me, it's been SEO. Like, I just kick myself for not doing this sooner because I think that for so long in my business, SEO felt really daunting. And it also felt like I felt like I wouldn't be able to do it on my own. I overcomplicated it. I was like, I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. I'm going to have to hire somebody, which is going to be money. And then I have to like vet someone to actually know that they were, they, they know what they're doing. And then after all of that conversation in my head, I was like, I'm just not going to do that. That sounds really complicated. Uh, um, and it wasn't until I admit like this year that I'm really wow. realizing like, okay, this is like – I'm making this so much harder for myself by wow. not focusing on this. So, you know, just like – and I think now I will say, I mean, as opposed to when I – you know, six, seven, eight years ago, like there are so many options now that are like actually – like cost wise doable for a lot of people. I think back in the day it was like you had to hire someone one on one and it was like this extraordinary cost. Um there are so many options now. So I just very much recommend like just start just just start researching it a little bit and like get yeah. comfortable with it because it really does make such a big difference. <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay. And then tell everyone where to find you and your freebie. Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram. I'm at krista.marie.photography. But then, um, yeah, if you enjoyed this podcast today, I would love to kind of as a next step, I have a free masterclass called Planning for Profit. Um, and really in this Master Gloss, we're diving deep into the mindset, financial, and the business strategies that you will want to look into if you're growing a, th- a thriving for- photography business or really any online business. It's like not uh-huh. specific to photography. But I just – we really dive deep into all of those pieces. So mindset, financial, and business strategies to kind of start to get you comfortable with what it's going to take in order to kind of reach the goals that you want to have. So yeah, especially if you love the the mindset aspect of it, like if you enjoyed the conversation today, like we dive deep into that kind of stuff too and and more. Yay. Thank you so much for being a guest. This is such an awesome conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.